Our guest this week on Veterans Chronicles is retired U.S. Army Major General Victor Hugo Jr. He is also a veteran of the Vietnam War. And General, thanks so much for your time today. Thank you. You're very welcome. Where were you born and raised, sir? Beverly, Massachusetts, and then moved to Marblehead and uh, grew up there until graduation from high school. And what type of history of military service was there in your family? None. None at all? No. How did you get interested in the service? I guess because my brother wanted to be a doctor and there wasn't enough money for both of us to go to college, so I decided to take the other road. Interesting. Now, some folks may be listening to this and thinking, Victor Hugo, I know that name from somewhere. You are related to the writer, correct? Supposed to be, yes, although I do not have the specifics of whatever it was my niece does. So, do you enjoy I got the name, but neither the talent <laughs> nor the money that went with it, okay? <laughs> do people ask you about it a lot? Yes, quite often. It's a great cocktail story starter. Excellent, and I hope you're a fan of the musical. Oh, yeah, very much. <laughs> Seen it a couple of times. Okay. Um, tell us about getting into West Point. What did that require? Okay, um, first you took a civil service examination to get the appointment. Uh, I got my appointment from Congressman William Bates. He had the 6th District in Massachusetts. Um, he was killed in October in a plane crash out at National Airport. Uh, Eastern Airlines went into the water there short of the runway. And uh, his son took over. He was a um, I believe in the Navy at the time. And he uh, was appointed to fill his, his father's vacancy. And he gave me the appointment. And then I took the entrance examinations for the academy and to include the physical and so forth. And was appointed and went in in the class of 54 in okay. June of, or July rather, of 1950. How did your life changed because of the routine and uh, all the different elements of what goes into being a cadet? Well, it changed drastically, you know. I mean, you, uh, uh, I should mention, you know, after high school, I went to a prep school in Washington that was a cram school for the academies. And um, so I was fortunate, you know, in going there because plebe academically was very easy for me because we took almost the entire plebe year at, uh, at Sullivan School. And um, I might add that I think there were 30-odd presidential appointments that year, and Sully got over 20 of them. So, uh, and a lot of the classmates that I had at the academy were also uh, graduates of Sullivan School. It's no longer there, but uh, it was a great, great experience. So when I got to the, uh, to the academy, it was just really getting used to the plebe system, doing all the things that were required there, and then academically was pretty easy. How are plebes treated? A lot differently than they are now. Um, it was sort of mind and matter. The academy didn't mind and you didn't matter. <laughs> and, um, you know, it, it, the discipline was, well, it was a great different than anything we had endured before. Uh, but I was fortunate I was playing athletics both hockey and lacrosse, so it, it wasn't as bad for me as it, as it was for some of the others. What's it like playing a major varsity sport at a military academy? Um, it, it, I don't know, I never played in college in any other place, <laughs> but it was, uh, you know, it was very disciplined. You had certain characteristics, certain things that, you know, spirit and so forth that you had to endure, but uh, very worthwhile, I thought. I really enjoyed it very much. I asked the question because uh, there was an author a while back named John Feinstein yes. who, who wrote a book on football at yeah. uh, West Point and Annapolis, I think, in particular, maybe Colorado Springs, too, and where he made the point that at the academy, football or whatever sport you're playing is probably the easiest thing you do, whereas at any other school, it's the most rigorous thing you yeah. do. Well, you, you practiced every day. You know, your academic day ended at 3 o'clock. Uh, you went, you changed clothes, and then, you know, you went to the practice field. Um, if you were on a varsity, you know, an, an A squad, if you will, you usually had uh, late, late chow. And uh, you didn't have to form up, you know, a 10 formation. And you just went to the mess hall and you had your own tables, if you will, your own section in Washington Hall where you ate. And, um, you know, when you had uh, the food was a little bit, a little more. 
I guess you would say. You always got eight quarts of milk and so forth, and uh, but the rest of the food was the same, except on game days when you usually had steak and so forth and so on. Yeah, that's not too bad. But no, it was uh, it was it was a way of life, and you were part of the cadet corps. You took the same classes everybody else did, and you just practiced every day. You didn't have drill all the time. Uh, you didn't have intramurals. You you practiced your sport. Now, while you were there, we should point out that you weren't part of it, but there was a major cheating scandal that happened at West yes. Point. Explain what happened and how that changed the academy. Uh, it was, I guess, it started during my plebe year, you know, or at least the investigation did. And because I was playing course squad sports, I was called in for an interview. And... Uh, and I was an academic coach for one of the people that was suspected. I might add that there, you know, there were probably uh, out of the 90 that were eventually uh, discharged, probably uh, I'd say the overwhelming majority were not cheaters. They knew about it. But according to the honor code, you know, you did not tolerate uh, lying, cheating, or stealing, nor tolerate those who did. And I think a lot of them knew, but they didn't say anything about, you know, their friends, and they went out as well. Um, and I know that during the summer between plebe year and yearling year, freshman and sophomore, that uh, those that were going to be discharged were brought to Camp Buckner, where our class was located, and it was during summer training. And, and I would say I knew just about everybody that was part of the 90. And it was uh, it was very gut wrenching to see them and to see, to know what happened to them. Um, I felt very sorry as a consequence of it, um, and it, it it just was you know to see a lot of your good friends go out the door, and uh, and that was just it. What was it like, graduation day, being commissioned? Um, busy <laughs> you know you got up you went down we graduated in the field house um, everybody threw their hats in the air you went up loaded your cars and took off and you had I think two months leave before you went to uh, depending upon what branch you were in before you went to your branch training and I was uh, going infantry so uh, I went home and uh, then I worked that summer for a landscaper and, um, you know, we got paid, yes, but I worked that summer for a landscaper until I went to Fort Benning in August. Talk about Fort Benning. Fort Benning was different. Um, we bought all our uniforms when we were cadets, obviously, and I bought mine uh, from Lauderstein in New York. And uh, because, I guess, behaviorally speaking, I was not a model cadet, and I had a lot of demerits. So I served confinements a great deal. Uh, never walked the area because I was playing sports, so I would just uh, serve confinements in my room and um, saved a lot of money doing that. So I paid for all my uniforms, paid for my car, and I had no debt when I left the academy. Um, went to Fort Benning, and the first question I was asked is, how many sets of fatigues do you have? Well, I didn't have any. And, you know, I didn't know what we were going to do at Benning, but then it turned out all my custom-made uniforms just hung in the closet and were never used. <laughs> and uh, so it was different, but it, was, uh, it gave you an idea as to what the Army was going to be all about, um, that what was going to happen, training was tough. Um, the basic course was not too bad. Uh, Ranger School was a lot different. Airborne School was different as well. So uh, it was different. What was the most challenging part for you, whether it's uh, Airborne or Ranger School? Probably Ranger was harder than Airborne School. Um, airborne School probably from uh, an organization physical activity was probably harder. Uh, Ranger School, you were depended on whatever situation you found yourself in, you know, whether you were a patrol leader or whether you were carrying a machine gun or whatever it was. It was 
it was different. You knew what it was. You, you, you knew what it was going to be like when you got into uh, the real thing. Yeah. From there, if I read your resume correctly, you were uh, sent to Colonel Edward Lansdale with the CIA. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, there were ten of us um, that had taken French at the academy, and um, we were approached. I guess probably December. And we were asked, you know, uh, would we be willing to take uh, an isolated assignment? And, um, and um, they didn't tell us where or anything. And so I said yes, and the other, the other nine did as well. Uh, five of us were single uh, bachelors, four were married, and, um, and one was just, he was there. And, uh, so we filled out, you know, a 24 page, as I recall, personal history statement and sent it in. And that was, we didn't hear anything else till probably, I guess, the end of February. And then we were given an assignment to report to an outfit in a certain room in the Pentagon. And that's what we did. And we found out we were all being um, detailed to CIA which at the time was located down in the, where the polo field is now, down off Independence Avenue near Lincoln Memorial. And that was the headquarters, well, not the headquarters, that was part of the CIA there. They were all temporary buildings. The headquarters was up on uh, Naval Observatory Hill on 23rd Street. And that's where the headquarters was of the agency at the time. That incidentally was the headquarters of OSS during World War II as well. So we went, um, we did training, and then we were all assigned to MAG Indochina. Um, the married people went to Thailand, along with uh, uh, one of the other classmates who went along with them. Um, then three of us went right away to MAG Indochina, and two were supposed to follow. Um, one followed and didn't stay but a couple of months, and the other one got married and didn't come at all. So three of us, there was Joe Palastra, who later commanded um, CENTCOM, um, myself and a gentleman that taught school at George Mason, George Mosley. Well, Mosley burned to death in a car accident, and Joe Palastra passed away a couple of years ago. So the last one alive is me. Wow. So we all went to... to we were under General, or then Colonel Lansdale, who had been the one that um, is credited with saving the Philippines from communism, put Mcsai Tsai in power. And then when he went to, when he went to what was then Indochina, Vietnam specifically, uh, he became very close with Ziem and put Godin Ziem in power as the prime minister. Bao Dai was still the emperor. And then a year later, in 56, I believe, they had elections, and ZM was elected president. This assignment came at a really critical time in that part of the world. The French had just lost at Dien Bien Phu in 54. Yep. Yep. So what was the priority um, for the CIA and the US government in terms of our role there following the collapse of the French? Well, it was interesting. We were restricted by the uh, Geneva Accords to 300 people there. And that was what it was. Later it was expanded, I think in 56 it was expanded to 600. They had a, what they called a, a term mission, technical economic recovery mission, where they brought in people to help get the Vietnamese army on its feet and do maintenance, uh, instruct them on maintenance, fix their rolling stock up and so forth and so on. So it, it was, uh, and the French were leaving. There was a tripartite group that was there that was supposed to oversee uh, following of the Geneva Accords. It was an Indian rep, a Polish rep, and a Canadian rep. And relations, I would say, between the French and the Americans was not good. Um, they didn't like the fact we were coming in. Um, we were not enamored with them and their lack of cooperation either. So it was kind of, a, it was America against everybody then, except the Canadians. Was your main job to interact with them or with your own people? 
how would you describe your day-to-day -day duties? Um, we, we all had, had different missions under Lansdale. Lansdale uh, had a small group. Uh, it was called the Saigon Military Mission. Uh, wasn't very big, I'd say maybe a total of 10 or 12. And uh, we did different things. Um, some of us were, uh, were a Psy warrior, and we did things, for example, with Operation Brotherhood that was Philippine doctors and nurses that we brought over. Um, some of us ran uh, operations. Uh, some of us uh, um, took Vietnamese officers to the Philippines for training with the Philippine Scout Rangers and, uh, you know, acted as interpreter translators for them and so forth. So it was a variety of things that we were doing trying to, to build up. But, but um, Lansdale, I, I would think his mission was to really put a government in place there that uh, um, I and Mike O'Daniels was the head of the MAG, and he was replaced in late 55 by uh, General Sam Williams. Hang and Sam, yeah, and um, they, uh, General Williams was very concerned about an invasion from the north. Uh, we were not as concerned with an invasion from the north as we were for, you know, for an uprising in the south. Because when supposedly both sides were to take their people, the south were going to take their people out of the north. The north was going to take their people out of the south. Um, the north didn't do what they were supposed to do. And with Operation Brotherhood, it was interesting because um, uh, going to the, to the uh, outlying areas, if you will, to the bush, uh, the first time many of those people had ever seen a doctor or a dentist or anything. And uh, when they saw what was happening, they started turning caches over to us. They started fingering people that were from the north that were there as uh, subversives and so forth. So it worked out very well. Now, uh, Colonel Lansdale also had two Filipino officers with us uh, that were on loan from the Philippine Army. That was um, uh, Colonel Napoleon Valeriano and uh, Colonel Jose Banzon. And both of them were experts at uh, counterinsurgency. They had both been with the 7th BCT and were part of uh, people that Lansdale had put in positions of influence in the Philippine government. Now, one of the jobs the CIA has is to project what they think might happen in a given spot down the road. You talked about the, the threats coming from the north. Did anyone at that time have an idea of what was coming a decade later, or was no. uh, that was never on the radar, that size of a conflict? No, we, we, were, we were totally interested and focused and occupied in trying to get the South Vietnamese on their feet. That was the ball game. Now, unfortunately, um, um, the ambassador, I can't recall who he was when I went in, but uh, later it was Jay Lawton Collins came in, and he did not agree with then Colonel Lansdale. And um, so Lansdale left the end of 56 and came back to the States, which was too bad. Um, uh, you know, I always thought that, you know, when, when ZM was assassinated in 63, that um, had Lansdale been there, he would have talked him into allowing his brother Godin Nu to go someplace as an ambassador. And uh, that would have eased the entire internal situation in Vietnam. How do you think your time there, even though you had no expectation of what was to come in the 60s, helped prepare you for that in terms of what you knew about the terrain, the people, and the politics there? <laughs> um, I, think, I think it was one, um, most of us really believed in what we were trying to do in Vietnam. Um, I won't say most of us, I'd say all of us did. Um, and we were committed to it. And so, uh, even though, you know, we left after a year and came back here, that uh, as, a, as a lieutenant, and I was then in the 3rd Infantry at, at uh, Fort McNair, the 2nd Battalion, and we were asked to, I was asked to give classes on Vietnam, what it was, and so forth. People, most people had never heard of it. 
and didn't know even where it was hardly. And um, so I, I think a lot of that, you know, you were prepared because you did some research on it, you know, and you knew certain things. And then communism, you know, was the big boogeyman. And, um, and I think, you know, it, it helped a lot to understand what we were doing, what the Cold War was all about, and so forth. Yeah. What were your priorities in training the Army of the Republic of Vietnam? What were the challenges and goals there? Well, to begin with, most of them, um, I guess, uh, the senior the senior officers in, in the Vietnamese Army had very little training. Most of them had been non-commissioned officers, sous officiers, as the French called them. There weren't many that had, you know, had commission officers. They had not, not had a great deal of training, you know, as when you think about, you know, what military officers go through training, and particularly senior officers. Uh, they had had almost none of that. And so it was kind of learning on the go for them. Um, for the junior officers, we set up a military academy at Dalat, and, uh, and then we would take these junior officers and um, take them to the Philippines, you know, for training with people. It was fortunate the Philippines used American equipment. They had all been trained by Americans. They used American doctrine, American tactics, the whole thing, except they also had the experience of combating an insurgency and, and doing it in a way that they won. That was the bottom line there. Um, and so these people, they would help, you know, these Vietnamese officers to appreciate, you know, what they had to do. Like if they went into a village, they were not just to take what they wanted, they would ask for it and pay for it and so forth. And, you know, how to act, how to, how to conduct operations and so forth. So in that respect, it was very worthwhile. Now, there were no real operations, no combat operations during 55 and 56. It was basically psi war and getting people to understand how they had to, what they had to do to combat insurgency. Yeah. So when you came back home, you had the opportunity to serve in the Old Guard. Yes. Which is a great honor, of course. Uh, yep. Tell us about your, your time there. We'll talk about your, your interesting connection to the Tomb of the Unknowns in just a moment, but what, what did you do day to day there? I uh, started out, I was a platoon leader in uh, E Company, 2nd Battalion. Um, we did all the honor cordons, you know, at the time out at National Airport. Um, we, we also did uh, funerals that were outside, you know, Arlington Cemetery. Uh, you did training. Um, and it was, you know, basically routine business there that you did, you know, that you would do in the Army. You did training out there, you marched, you know, you did drill and so forth. It was not terribly exciting, um, kind of routine, if you will. But, but there were things that happened, you know, and so forth, and you got to, um, you also got to be uh, very independent, you know, as to what you were doing, because you, you were sent to do things, and you were on your own when you got there. Um, and I enjoyed that. Now, I was there about, um, in E Company, about 10 months. And then I was transferred to, um, to the headquarters, and I was an assistant three in the regimental headquarters. And then shortly thereafter, the uh, regiment became a battle group. And um, so they moved part of the three to the two, uh, S2 section and made the two the ceremonial group for the 3rd Infantry. So I became the ceremonial officer for the 3rd Infantry as a first lieutenant, which, which was really interesting. Um, and we did such things as, you know, for all the that visiting heads of state, uh, all that planning was done in the two. And it was, it was kind of heady stuff for a, for a young second lieutenant, for a first lieutenant then. And I remember when Queen Elizabeth came in 57, um, those that were participating in the ceremonies for her um, were, were given Army Blues. And the Philadelphia Quartermaster Depot came down and measured each one of us, and we were all given ceremonial blues. And, and there was no nylon on those uniforms. 
was all gold bullion, and it was it was bloody expensive, I'm sure. And that's, that was the first time that the third wore the ceremonial blues. And I know that was the first time also that we had state and territorial colors. And when the queen came to lay the wreath at the tomb, um, she didn't come from, you know, the building up on top, the tomb guard. Uh, she came from the bottom up the thing. And we had state and territorial colors, all of whom uh, it was a no verbal commands was all done by flag signal. And, uh, you know, that was, everybody wondered if that would work, and fortunately it did. So I saved what little remained of my career then. <laughs> <laughs> now then when um, we did the uh, internment of World War II in Korea, that I wrote the order for that, and I have a copy of that at home right now. And, um, the honorary pallbearers were all Medal of Honor winners from World War II in Korea. And I got them to sign two programs, one I gave to Major Jim Williams, my boss, and the other program I kept. So I have all the signatures from the honorary pallbearers, all 16 of them from World War II in Korea, that were honorary pallbearers for the internment. And it was interesting because I think the superintendent of Arlington was Jack Metzger, and his son later became the superintendent. And when I saw him, I said, you know, geez, you really owe me your life. Because we go to church, you know, in the Old Post Chapel on Sundays, and Jack would always lean over to his son and say, if you don't stop that, I'm going to kill you. And I said, Jack, don't do it here, you know, you'll get in trouble. <laughs> but... Uh, it, it, w it was a great assignment. I really, uh, Colonel Brennan was the commander. Um, and they were, Hank Aaron, who later became the uh, assistant chief of staff for intelligence, you know, was there. There were a lot of people that were there. Um, Sam Adams was my company commander. He won a Medal of Honor in Korea on uh, Hill 875. Uh, there were a lot of people there that, you know, later became very well known in the Army. Absolutely. It's amazing to think of a early 30s Queen Elizabeth coming to, yeah. to visit, and of course she's still on the throne, so that's absolutely amazing. Uh, from there, you went to Special Forces training. Well, I went, I, I transferred to artillery. There was a lot of us at, uh, in the third that uh, there was a tremendous imbalance in officer strength, and so there were some branches that were, uh, that were woefully under, under strength, if you will. And so I think um, my company commander, J.B. Harmeling, was the first one that transferred branch. And he went to artillery, and he was with the, the 30th Brigade, I think, which was down at South Post at the time. And, um, and he did it, and he said, gee, this is great. You know, I'm going to go to advanced schooling. Well, you know, we said, geez, this is much better than what we've got. So there were several of us, Vern Gillespie, myself, uh, Harmeling, transferred artillery, um, some transferred engineers, some went signal corps, and so forth, and it was all. So I went, uh, when I transferred to artillery, I was put into missiles, went to Fort Bliss, and then I went to Loring Air Force Base in Maine, and I was in the same battery up there for three years, uh, right on the New Brunswick, uh, U.S. border. And in fact, you could throw a stone from our battery to New Brunswick. And um, it was winter there, 10 months out of the year, I think. <laughs> it was, boy, it was, the day I got there was, um, it was about 30 below with a 40 knot wind blowing and snowing. And it was like that. We could only put people, I had, we had 35 foot towers for our radars. And you could only have maintenance men up there 15 minutes at a time because it was so cold for them. And uh, but it was it was worthwhile. You got a you got a chance to really know how a battery company size unit operated because you were there long enough to know it. So the winter. And then I went from there to SF. Yeah. So the the winter is quite a bit different in Maine on the Canadian border, even compared to Massachusetts where you grew up. Yeah, it is much different. Wow. Much different. We all had big, uh, every battery had a snowblower 
you know, a big uh, thing in the front that was probably as big as that wall there, and it would you would just run it into the snow and blow it out the top. You know, I mean, it was like you see in the Alps. Yeah. We all had them, and it was uh, it winter was tough, but worthwhile. You got it toughened you up, I guess. Um, so, all right, so talk about Special Forces uh, and that experience, getting ready for that. Okay, uh, I volunteered for it. I came down here and talked to, uh, to OPPO about going to SF, and um, they were not keen on it. In fact, I was told uh, we don't like to assign regular Army officers to Special Forces. Oh, okay. Um, so I went down into the advanced course. Uh, midway through the advance course, they came and asked if, if uh, called a group of us together and asked if we would uh, volunteer for an isolated assignment. And I said, yes, I would again. And uh, that was to go to Laos. Laos at that time was, you know, very important. And uh, so I volunteered to go to Laos and um, got orders assigning me to Fort Sill awaiting a worldwide MAG assignment. And I volunteered that I would go, but only if I could go on a field artillery MOS. Uh, now, about that time, the Special Forces was getting a lot of attention that um, President Kennedy had visited uh, Fort Bragg and had given the SF the Green Beret and so forth. So about, um, I guess about uh, two months before the end of the advance course, uh, I was assigned to SF. And I called my assignment officer, and I, I intended to thank him, which I did, and he apologized. I'm sorry, you know, we had to put people in and so forth. And uh, now I, I was very happy with it. Um, one of my fellow battery commanders from Maine, Herb Hardy, went. He was later killed, got the Distinguished Service Cross. Um, Jim Brott. Uh, he was killed also. George Niefler got pretty badly racked up. Um, but we all went to the, uh, to the first group, which was Okinawa, which was focused on, uh, on Asia, Vietnam. Uh, went through training. I became, I guess because I had been in Vietnam before when I arrived at the group, um, uh, Colonel Garrett, who had been my TAC at West Point, by the way, uh, was the commander of the group, and uh, so I was assigned to set up an area study program for every detachment that was going down to Vietnam. Now we had, at any given time, we had 32 A's in uh, A teams in Vietnam, and we had two B's, and the C was the provisional unit, and uh, so we set up this program where they would they would spend two months getting ready. They would study the language. They would study the area to which they were going to be deployed. Uh, they would talk to people that had been there so that when they went in, they knew who the people were. They knew what the area was like. They had a good appreciation for what the enemy threat was there and so forth and so on. So I set that up. When I got that set up, then I went on a mobile training team to Thailand for four months. Then I came back, I got my A team, and then I went back to Vietnam. Um, in, in the mountains with the Montagnards. Then I came back and I became the Group S2 and uh, until I left to go to the Commander General Staff College. So you were in Vietnam this time from 1962 to 1965. I, I was there really 63, 64, and we went six months at a clip. And then I was on a special mission in 65 I was on a special mission in Laos and then back to Vietnam. And the reason being is um, uh, there's a sect in Vietnam called the Cao Dai. Uh, the Cao Dai were one of the three principal sects. There was the Hua Hao, the Ben Zuyan, and the, and the Cao Dai. The Ben Zuyan revolted in 55 against CM. Ben Zuyan ran the dope and prostitution in, in Vietnam. And ZM crushed them. The Cao Dai went to Tay Ninh, which is north northwest of Saigon. And um, they organized along the lines of the Roman Catholic Church. The head of the Cao Dai was Pope Tak, 
he had a big cathedral in Tainin with uh, the significant aspect, architectural aspect of it, was it had a big eye, you know, that just looked on everything. Oh, wow. But they also had a series of saints, and one of the saints was Franklin Roosevelt, and another one was Victor Hugo, so I was sent to work with them after the mission in Laos. And so I worked with them for a while. You mentioned earlier in our conversation the assassination of No Dinh Diem. Yeah. And of course, later in the same year, President Kennedy's assassinated. Yeah. Um, you're half a world away from the Kennedy assassination. You're right there for when the Vietnamese leader is killed. How did that change either tactics or the mindset of what might be coming next? <clears throat> for us at the, at the bottom of the food chain, chain didn't, didn't change that much. Um, we didn't know what was going to happen. So most of us, I think almost every A team that was there, just continued to do whatever we were doing. Uh, we all had Vietnamese with us, uh, and we just said, look, this is way above us, you know, let's continue to march. The war will still go on. And so we did. So it, it didn't have much effect on us now. Um, the interesting thing was in, in Vietnamese business, uh, you know, here it was a very orderly procession from uh, to Lyndon B. Johnson took over the president. Over there, it was musical governments. Uh, we went from went from Ziem, we went to Khan, Nguyen Khan, and then we went to uh, to Khao Ki, and then we back to Khan, then Tu, and we had almost a government a month. And, um, and it was hard on the Vietnamese, you know, but we just continued to march. It didn't make much difference to us one way or the other. Did it escalate what was coming at them? Did they sense weakness and disarray from no, the enemy? No, no, I think every, every A team that I knew, including my own, we just continued to march. It was, nothing changed. You also helped to develop what's known as an attack assessment matrix. Yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit about how that got started and, and how it was created. Well, uh, you know, at the time we were having camps that were, that were being hit. And um, because, uh, you know, the other side didn't like the fact that we were there. And so there were camps that were being hit. In fact, one of the ones that was hit was Roger Donlan's camp up in Northern i -Corps, And he won the Medal of Honor for that evening. But, um, we, we decided what we would do is um, we would see, do an area assessment, you know, do an assessment of every camp that was hit and see if we could pick out things that were indicators that your camp might be getting close. And so that's what we did. We set up this matrix of things that was sort of indicators that would tell you, and we showed each camp what it was and that, you know, what, what they could see as triggers, you know, that this was something that was about to happen. And that's what we did. We went down every camp, did an assessment of each one and put together all the indicators that would show, you know, and we did it by camp so that people would understand that, you know, this wasn't just one thing. It was every camp had these indicators. And that's what we did. We put that together and we worked with, uh, we had an intelligence detachment with the, with the first group on Okinawa the 441st, and we used them, and we went back in and looked at every single one of these camps that had been hit and came out with the indicators and gave that to all the teams that were going down. How much did you see results improve in terms of security? Well, what you would get out of that was you would get the camps, you know, would alert their higher headquarters, I think, you know, we got something going here, and then, you know, it would, it would take, take place. In addition to that, um, my A team got split, and half of them went to the Trang, and they were called an Eagle Flight. And their mission was to uh, was to be ready to go to the relief of any one of these camps that was hit. And they had a couple of Strike Force companies with them as well. From there, you also did some training with foreign armies. Uh, yes. Thailand, Taiwan, and Korea. Yep. How did that all interweave into what the larger mission was there? Well, it was, you know, the first group was focused on Asia. 
And uh, so we went, and of course, the Thais in Southeast Asia, you know, were, we considered them to be a prime target because the Laotians, you know, and the Thais and the Lao were very close. And, uh, and so we were trying to get across to them what were indicators of insurgency. If you had high interest rates, you had corruption in the government, you know, people were dissatisfied with their lot in life and so forth and so on. And we were trying to get that across to them and, you know, work with, uh, work with Thai units and to see if we could help them understand how they would, how, how they might have to con counter an insurgency. And, uh, and we'd take them on a, a 10 day FTX at the end. I worked with a regiment going out of uh, Prachin Bari. And, uh, you know, it was a very different thing. I remember one of the things I wanted to do was I wanted to take them on a, on a, a, a movement from Prachinburi across the mountains into, um, into Karat, to the Karat Plateau, Nakhon Rachisima. And so I had everything laid on. You know, I had gone to the Air America guys. They were going to give us helicopter support. We had it all laid on. And the regimental commander said no. And I, you know, and then he gave me, well, we might have a medical problem. And I said, I got helicopters for that. You know, well, we'll have a logistic problem. No, because I've got prearranged drops and so forth. And everything, everything I, everything he came up with, I had a counter to. And he just said, we're not going to do it. And I said, why? And he said, because years ago there was a Thai unit that went through the mountains and they never came out and their ghosts are still there and we're not going. And I said, okay, got it. So that was it. So you dealt with that. Now the Koreans were a lot different. Um, they, they, were, uh, they, they were good, you know, as opposed to what they were in the 50s. In the 60s, they were coming into their own and, and they were excellent. They were well-trained, tough, uh, knew what they were doing. Chinese were the same way. Uh, you know, we'd have trouble communicating, you know, with the new radios we had, and they'd be using a PRC-10 with a bent wire coat hanger as an antenna and talking to the world, you know, and we couldn't figure out how in the world they were doing it, but they were doing it. So it, it was educational for us as well as instructional. Tell us a little bit about Operational Detachment Alpha. That was another assignment that you had, I've read. Okay, that was the A-team. That was the A-team, okay. That was my A-team. Okay. Uh, then you came back home yep. and worked for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Yes. What was your job there? I started out in J3. Uh, I was the only major on the staff at the time. And I had been brought there. My roommate in Newport was uh, Hank Muston, and his father was the J3. And the father was trying to get younger officers into J3. And so I was picked to go, and which, which I was very, very fond. I started out in Atlantic South working Panama Canal and Latin America. And because I had already been to Vietnam three times, I was moved over to Pacific Division. And, uh, and I worked there. And, um, and, and that was, that was, it was incredible. Uh, that was really, I mean, you had a lot of work. Um, and, you know, you'd go to work at like five in the morning, get home at eight or nine at night, 24 seven. And uh, I mean, you were busy there. And that was the big focus on whatever, whatever was going on, you know, was Vietnam. And uh, so I did that for two years and then I volunteered to go back to Vietnam. Before that happened though, you were also part of the, the group uh, working on Rolling Thunder. Uh, yes. Looking at targets for the bombing campaign. Yep, yep, and that was with, uh, General McConnell was chief of staff of the Air Force. Uh, his navigator was Henry Edlin, and Edlin had a had a, a good sized room, and it was all maps all over the wall. And Edlin used to pick the targets, and then he would send them up to uh, SecDef, and that would, they, we would get the go, and that was what it was. But it was uh, that that was you talk about minutia control. I mean, I, I had never seen anything like that in my life. But that's what it was. Just last week we had the opportunity to speak with General McMaster, who of course wrote yeah. the book on 
Uh, yeah, dereliction of duty. Dereliction of duty, and his major point is that the politicians kind of shove the Joint Chiefs of Staff out of the decision-making process more than they should have. What was your experience in the politicians versus military aspect? Uh, I would say that, you know, that's a hard thing to say. Um, I know that, that, uh, that McNamara ran it all. There was no question on that. Um, and and uh, uh, an Army BG, geez, what the hell is his name? Joe Plover. He and I used to alternate taking sit maps to the White House every morning and briefing them on it. And then we would have to go down and brief the Congress and so forth. Um, I think General Wheeler had a, had a pretty good relationship with, with the White House. I don't know about his relationship so much with SecDef. Um, and I know toward the end of, I guess, uh, 68, I'm trying to, Clark Clifford came in and replaced McNamara, and he, his assessment was, get out of it. Um, which to a lot of us, you know, it staggered us that somebody would say that. And, um, and I know in, in um, beginning in 68 when they had case, it was Tet mm -hmm. and Kaysan, and oh, I think everybody in Washington, you know, that had anything to do with that war was turned on with the Kaysan Tet business. Not so much with Tet as it was with Kaysan. Because everybody was saying, oh, this is the American DMBN poo, you know, and so forth. And everybody, we briefed, God, we must have briefed three or four times a day, all over town, about Kaysan. And, um, and, you know, there was just no question it was not going to fall. I mean, there was no way it could. And, um, and that was what it was. But it, it, it was, it was a lot of, you know, very, very minute control of everything that was going on. So the Vietnam you returned to, quite a bit different atmosphere than when you yeah. when you left. Yeah. So in March of 69, you're back there commanding the 1st Battalion of the 44th Artillery. Right. Uh, explain where you were and what your I was at Dong Ha, which was um, pretty much the northernmost town in South Vietnam. Um, that's where the 3rd Marine Division was located. Uh, and where my battalion was located. When I initially went back to Vietnam, I went back in, in um, 68, in uh, the summer of 68, and I did, I did the planning for how we were gonna pull the U.S. forces out, the Army forces. And we were gonna stand down, you know, units farther, the farthest out, we would stand them down 45 days. We had done liaison with Department of Agriculture, Commerce, everybody that would have anything to do with people coming back into the states. And, uh, and then at the end, we were told, pull a flag. And we did, we took the 9th Division out of the Delta and moved them north to uh, Vung Tau, Cap St. Jacques, and then sent them out. And um, then I went and took the battalion up on the DMZ where um, the defenses along the DMZ were Contien, uh, Gialin, Ocean View, and it went all the way out, you know, to Quezon, although Quezon had been removed at that time other than a place that we would do operations. So that's where we were located uh, at Dong Ha. We took, I guess, incoming pretty close to every night, whether it was artillery or rockets. Um, about once a month, the ammo dump would go up, which was big for the July operation, you know. I mean, it was a hell of a good show. Um, and I had people all over, all over I-Corps. Uh, I was in general support of I-Corps. I had a battalion of dusters that was twin 40s mounted on a tank chassis. I had 64 of them. I had uh, 18 quad 50s. That's four 50 caliber machine guns on a, uh, you know, mounted on a, uh, I guess a small, chair, if you will, and I had searchlights, and I had, I was in 30, 30 plus different locations in Northern i -Corps. and I used to visit them all once a month, drive or however I could get there. So that was it. 
What was your assessment at this point? I asked you before about the, the training of uh, Vietnamese uh, service members several years before this. At this point, how would you describe the caliber of our South Vietnamese allies as well as the enemies that we okay. were fighting? Uh, the Vietnamese unit that was up there, in addition to the to the uh, 3rd Marine Division, was the 2nd uh, Regiment, Ben High Regiment, and it was commanded by an old friend of mine. Um, he and I had both been captains in, he was in the Luc Long Doc Viet, Vietnamese Special Forces. I was in U.S. Special Forces. And we had known each other, had worked with each other before. So when he was the regimental commander and I had the battalion, and we just got along very well. So I was training his people to take over my unit. And, uh, you know, on maintenance, I had them working in our motor pool. I would put, you know, some of his officers with my officers to see how we did things and so forth. And it, it worked very well. He was a very, very professional guy. Uh, he later, after I left, he was given a division. The, his regiment was augmented and became a division. And as happens often in, in the military, regardless of U.S. or otherwise, when you make a new division, every other division is called upon to put people in it. And you don't give them the best you have, if you follow what I'm saying. Yeah. And he got the culls. And when I left, there was a picture of him, I think, in 72, when the North invaded the South and came across the Quaviet, the river that was up there that separated the two. And he was in the river trying to get his people to turn and go back, that the enemy was that way, not that way. So they invaded, and, um, and uh, Vu was thrown in jail by Tu, and then he was in jail up until the North took over, and then he got out, and the North threw him in jail again. He died about, he, they got to uh, California, and he died about three years ago. But I used to talk to him on the phone about, you know, once a month see how he was doing and so forth. But, but in my opinion, they were very willing people. Um, I guess my great regret is we didn't keep our word. We said we would support, you know, regardless, and we didn't. And they all went down. Two follow-ups on that. First of all, how would you describe Vietnamization? Uh, what did it look like to you, and why didn't it work? Um, well, first of all, I think it was, you know, it was almost too little too late. Uh, for me, it worked out very well because we just, we had a battalion. We brought the people in. We did the OJT on them, you know, helped them, let them do maintenance on, you know, the different vehicles we had. Uh, we had their officers go with us and NCOs go with us on operations so that they could see what we were doing, how we were doing it. And I think it worked pretty well, but you got to remember, there was a camp there, J.J. Carroll, that was inactivated. Then it was reactivated. Uh, you know, it was, a, it was a big area to control, and they didn't have all the assets that our units did. They didn't have a lot of helicopters, you know. Vehicles were at a premium. Uh, they just didn't have the assets that we had. And they didn't have the experience either. Um, even though, you know, they would say, some of them would say to me when we'd come in, um, well, I know you're going to say this is the year we're going to win it. Uh, you'll be here for a year, you'll leave, and I'll still be here. And, and some of them had been at war 20 years. Uh, my wife is Vietnamese. She was, uh, she was born in 39, and all she knew when she left the day that Saigon fell and, you know, went out to the South China Sea and was picked up by a, uh, a U.S. ship called the uh, Kirk. There's a book on it called The Lucky Few. But until that time for her life, from 39 to 75, all she had known was war. It was the Japanese first, then the French, then the VC, then the NVA, and that's all she knew. I won't say that's all she knew. She was smart, she was, you know, her family was well-to-do. 
and she was an, an, a French instructor at La Salle Institut Taber, the best French school in Vietnam. And she came here and she wound up, she retired in 02 as the director of refugee services for the YMCA. So, but, but you know, we, we think, you know, our life, what you do, who you do, and all of a sudden you find somebody that 30 plus years, all she knew was war makes a difference. It makes a huge difference. It's yeah. an amazing perspective, and her story is amazing, too. I know yeah. she's been profiled uh, before as well. Uh, after you came home, yeah. you were very much involved in the debate over how to put together an army. In other words, the draft versus yeah. the volunteer army. Um, talk about your position in that and, and how the decision-making got made there. Okay, they, when I came out of the War College in, I guess, 72, 71, yeah, 71. And um, uh, General Westmoreland was the chief of staff. He had gotten a letter from a, from a young major that was going to Marine Corps schools, Army major named Tony Nadal. And he gave his impression of what the Army was going through. Now, Nadal was a, a, had been uh, trained as a behaviorist, a uh, social scientist, but a behaviorist, along with some others in the Army, and they taught MPNL at uh, Military Psychology and Leadership at the Army at West Point. And, uh, and he told General Westmoreland, you know, you're on your, you're on your knees, in effect. And General Westmoreland decided he better do something. So he got a hold of um, uh, a BG that was down at 18th Airborne Corps called uh, Emerson, Hank Emerson, the gunfighter. And he set up the Conark Leadership Board, and they were She's, I guess, eight or nine or however many teams, or three people each. And there was a field grade officer, a sergeant major, and a behaviorist. And we went through the Army talking about, you know, the Army leadership study that had been done at the War College and the professionalism study. And, you know, to uh, most of the NCOs had a pretty good feel for what the hell was going on. Um, Almost none of the senior officers could could understand it. You know, could even appreciate it. When we say, you know, your um, your readiness reporting is, it's supposed to be an indicator where you need help, but it's turned out to be a, a nothing but a lie. And oh no, that can't be true. Well, they were getting an education as well. So out of that, uh, we went and we were on the road from, I guess, the summer of um, the summer of '71 to the summer of '72, and um, and we all got training down at the uh, Center for Creative Leadership in North Carolina, which was extraordinarily beneficial, and and a lot of that came out of that was. The Sergeant's Major Academy uh, that was then at uh, Biggs Field in El Paso. Um, things like we did command climate surveys for new commanders coming in. I did it for every one of my battalion commanders when I had 32nd Adcom. So they would have a fair, I mean it was all done, it was, um, there was no, uh, no identification of people or anything. It was just, here are the facts and they could do with them as they wished. Um, and I'd say it, it had a lot to do with the Army getting back on its feet, you know, that trying to stress things like goals, values, uh, integrity, you know, and the rest of this. And I think, and a large part of that was due to, uh, uh, after Westmoreland, of course, came General Abrams, and he was pushing it, you know, and so forth. And, uh, and he had a lot to do with, he was a solid, you know, um, fatigue guy that had great common sense. And, and that's what the Army became, you know, we had the National Training Center and the rest of it. Now, in, uh, while this was all going on, we also had the movement toward the volunteer Army. You know, Volar, which we was volunteer Army, and the troops had another name for it. They called it Victory Over Lifers and Regulations, as the troops would do. Um, and there was a group set up under General Forsyth 
that was, you know, some very bright guys, and they were changing things. And, and there was a lot of push and take on this. Um, senior NCO, you know, the Army wants to join you. Most of us said, I don't want to join them. And they didn't understand that the reason, the rationale behind the expression was, we're willing to change. And, but that didn't, it was never explained to people. So, and so we learned a lot out of that too. And, um, and I think, you know, to, to an extent, you know, some people would say, well, we're way back where we were, you know, in the mid 70s again. A lot of political correctness and so forth, so. When you came home, uh, the final time from Vietnam, uh, did you have any difficult experiences with protesters uh, seeing you in uniform? Oh, and yeah. I, in February of that year, my father passed away. And I came home and uh, I was in San Francisco waiting for a plane to go to Boston. And a little old lady came up, spit on me, you know, baby killer, you know, swine, you know, and all this. My first inclination was to punch her out, which I didn't. Uh, and then I just looked at her and I said, Madam, I wear this uniform so that you are entitled to do what it is you just did. And if that makes you feel better, good. And that was it. But uh, there was a lot of people, uh, people didn't like Vietnam vets at all. And I think it was very, very misplaced. We did what we, would, we had to do. And that was it. And, uh, you know, you see a lot of it even today. You know, you see there's a group that really uh, understands and appreciates the sacrifice that American veterans have made and what they are making today. Um, but there are others that, you know, there are some people, in my opinion, that hate America, that are Americans, and they want to change it. And they want to get rid of everything that had to do with, you know, our heritage, um, you know, what our values are, our goals, they want to change all that. They hate it the way it is. And it, it's, a, it's sad to me. What was your reaction? You talked about this a little bit ago when we did not continue to support the South Vietnamese. What was your reaction when ultimately the funding was rejected and Saigon fell in 1975? Shame. Um, Shame from the perspective that um, we promised and we didn't keep our promise. Um, and I was, uh, you know, in, in 76, uh, Lee Kuan Yew, who was then the Prime Minister of Singapore, came to the States and um, he talked to the President and told him, you know, hey, dominoes didn't happen because of what you did, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then, you know, we need some help because if we don't get this help, um, then we're going to go down the tube. And so there was a, a, a three-person task force. There was Bill Crow, later became chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and at the time he was in um, international security affairs in, in SecDef. Ted Shackley, who was the prince of dirty tricks at, at the agency, and myself. And we were sent to Southeast Asia to uh, look at all these countries, you know, and how could we help them. Well, these, these countries, you know, they, what they thought was we had a big pipeline going into Vietnam that was full, and it was swollen, and I want part of it. And I know, God, we got to Malaysia, and I got a 10-page a ten ten-page document that was nothing but line after line of what they wanted. And I just said, we don't have it, because we didn't have it. And, uh, and that surprised them. But, um, you know, they were all, hey, it's there, why don't we go for it? And um, as it turned out, you know, we didn't have it either. A couple more uh, minutes in our conversation with retired U.S. Army Major General Victor Hugo Jr. And sir, uh, a few years after this, you did some work improving the efficiency of the Patriot missile, which about a decade later would come in very, very handy for the United States. Uh, yeah. Talk about that a little bit. Um, 
I was the director of management in the Army, and um, the vice chief, um, Maxwell Thurman, said, you know, we, uh, we want you to go and command the 32nd in Europe. That was the Army Air Defense Command there. And which, geez, I thought that would be a great deal, you know, and so forth. And um, so he said, we're going to have a decision brief on the Patriot. And I said, oh. He said, would you like to sit in? And I said, oh, yeah, that'd be nice. So we went, and um, the one that was the test battalion commander later became my G4 in, in uh, the 32nd. But he had three batteries, and he briefed on what he had gone through and so forth. Now, what I was interested in was the mission capable time. And, uh, and it was not a very pleasing prospect. It was less than 15% mission capable time. In other words, they could only be on the air 15%, no more than 15% of the time. Now, um, back in the 50s when we introduced Hercules, uh, we had a lot of problems with that missile system. And a lot of battery commanders, you know, and battalion commanders, they couldn't keep the system on the air. And, and their careers were ruined. Um, Jesus, it was almost a wholesale slaughter, you know. And if you were fortunate enough not to have a Hercules battery or battalion, you were lucky. You were one of the very fortunate few. And I was not going to go through that with Patriot. So when it came around the table, everybody said, deploy it, deploy it, deploy it. And I said, I don't want it. And they said, what do you mean you don't want it? I don't want it. It doesn't work. And um, so the, uh, I think the program manager, who the uh, project manager, was Max Bunyard. He said, well, we know what's wrong. We can fix it. And I said, then fix it. And so anyway, there was a lot of discussion. And finally it was, well, General Rogers, who was shape at the time, said, um, they said, well, he wants it right away. And I said, well, I'll talk to him. So I called him on the phone and I said, you know, I just went through this, it doesn't work. And he said, what do you suggest? And I said, don't take it, tell him to fix it. He said, go for it, so we did. It took Raytheon a year and a half to fix it. And they fixed it so that when it was deployed, we ran a 95% mission capable time. And I said, you know, not only do I want it fixed, but I want all my authorized stockage list and my prescribed load list on spare parts. I want it on the ground. And then very fortunately, my deputy in the 32nd became the program manager for the Patriot. So he and I had conversations every night. And that's what it worked, and it worked well. Sir, we're just about out of time, unfortunately. Uh, as you look back at your incredible military career spanning decades in service to our country, what comes to your mind most, and what are you most proud of? Um, what comes to my mind most is how lucky we are to live here. You know, uh, I think many of us have lived in other countries. Um, I lived in Saudi Arabia for eight years, you know, the last great place in the world for a male chauvinist. And, um, and, and I like the Saudis. I liked every place I've been. I got along with them all. But no matter how you cut it, this is the best place in the world to live. You know, and it's worth any sacrifice anybody wants to make. And I think that what I'm most proud is a lot of the, the soldiers with whom I worked, um, that how much they have given and how little really they are appreciated for what they've done for this country. Well, General, we appreciate what you've done for this country thank and you. those you served with. Thank you so much for your service to our country, and thank you very much for your time with us today. We greatly appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you very much. You bet, sir. Retired U.S. Army Major General Victor Hugo, Jr., veteran of the Vietnam War. I'm Greg Corumbus. This is Veterans Chronicles.